you very much. So it's really wonderful to be here. Um, I was telling John Kilner this afternoon that a lot of the time I speak, it's to hostile audiences who don't agree with my core assumptions. So I really rejoice being here with like-minded people. And especially to deliver this lecture named after my long, long time friend, John. John and I, how long have we known each other? 40 years, maybe? Are we that old? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, it's really an honor because um, John is one of the, the truly, truly deep-minded and, and conscientious people in this field whose thoughts I respect greatly and whose life I respect greatly. So I've chosen a, a grand title for my talk tonight, a little different words on your brochure, that's okay. Um, one with important implications for practical dimensions of human life, theoretical dimensions, and obviously for what it means to be the imago Dei, the image of God. It would be tempting for me to try to discuss all that in one lecture, but since I'm a physician and trained as a biologist, and you have here in my presence one of the leading authorities on matters of Imago Dei. What I want to do for you is just lay out some perspectives from biology, from the natural groundings, um, the foundations which make possible those dimensions of life we describe as our spiritual nature. So this is kind of an outline and a quick journey through these subjects. Nonetheless, if I do this right, I think you can see that it has enormous implications for where we're going as a species. According to the National Intelligence Council report, Global Trends 2030, Alternative Worlds, we're at a critical juncture in history, which could lead to widely contrasting futures. Nowhere is this more evident than the promise and peril of our advancing biotechnology and associated applications of information technologies. Together with recent insights from ethology, the study of animal behavior, new perspectives and powers associated with advances in genetics, neurobiology, cognitive psychology, artificial intelligence, and robotics are blurring the boundaries between humans, animals, and machines, and raising conceptual and practical problems of profound significance for the human future. What is the meaning of apparent mind, emotion, and moral awareness in animals? Are humans, as some maintain, just another ordinary animal species? What are we to make of Predictions of conscious machines, neuromorphic computers, robotic servants, caregivers, and companions. Can human nature be reduced to information processing? Are we, as MIT professor Marvin Minsky said, are we just a meat machine? Will biotech-mediated enhancements of human physical and mental powers open new horizons or disrupt aspects of our humanity? Should we alter human physiology to increase our sensory range, dramatically extend the human lifespan, or genetically alter our offspring to enable interplanetary space travel? And what issues of human dignity arise with cerebral organoids? These are partial brain segments made from stem cells or with the creation of human-animal chimeras for tissue production or scientific research, including placing human neurons into the brains of neonatal rats. Th that's, can we turn the lights down a little? Is that possible so we can get a little better view of the pictures? Hmm. Um, anyway, this is not an actual photograph. It's a drawing, so don't worry. Um, If you can get these behind me, that'd be great. Yeah, that's better. Okay. So, so um, cerebral organoids, human-animal chimeras, and what issues arise with 
human machine cyborgs, brain computer interfaces, and modular neural transplants, all of which has been working and coming down on us. And how are we how are we regard and relate to ancestral human species or possible future humans, future forms of human life? As you may know, there are proposals to de-extinction Neanderthals. And the transhumanists have projects of evolution by design. They argue that our advancing genetic and neurotechnologies offer us the opportunity to escape the constraints and cruelties of an amoral evolutionary process to lift humanity, humanity to its next level of personal and social flourishing as human, machine, post-humans. Their, their, their agenda ranges from gen direct genetic alteration, and you read that quote, it's a little scary, um, all the way to dramatic combinations with machines. And by the way, their symbol is H plus, humans plus, okay? At the heart of these dilemmas are fundamental philosophical and theological questions regarding the source and significance of human life and our place and purpose as co-creators within the cosmic order. These challenges distill around three key questions. What are the unique and defining features of human nature? What is the relationship between the given and the good? How does individual and collective flourishing of human life depend on the specific biology of our naturally given embodied form? In what way could we alter or enhance aspects of our nature without eroding or relinquishing important dimensions of what it means to be human? And longer term, and most perplexing, what role with our will our technologies and the cultural ideas that guide them play in shaping the human future? And how do these relate to our ultimate destiny individually and collectively as a species made in the image of God? These questions were approached by John Templeton, by the way, very thoughtfully, eager to move beyond what we thought we knew to what we don't know. And um, it, it was a very interesting person on that regard. So in setting the frame for our thinking about these questions, it's essential to recognize the scope and potential impact of biotechnology. Driven by urgent human problems in agriculture, environmental science, and biomedicine, Global expenditures on research and development has reached $50 billion a year. In 2017, in the US alone, 700 biotech companies had a collective revenue of $150 billion. And this figure is compounding at a rate of 10% a year. Building on earlier scientific revolutions in chemistry and physics, the pace and momentum of advance in basic biology and translational biomedicine is simply staggering. Clearly, we are entering a multi-generational era of unprecedented advances in our ability to intervene at every level of human biology. Meanwhile, grounded in the Enlightenment's agenda as masters and possessors of nature, there is a slow but steady shift in the focus of medicine away from the tradition traditional role of healing, to the notion of liberation, liberation from natural constraints, from all that is unattractive, imperfect, or just inconvenient. Following in the paradigm of cosmetic surgery and driven by individual desires and ambitions, this notion is fostering acceptance of a broader and deeper technological revision of the human species. Together with a general trend to regard life's challenges as bioengineering problems, there is, at least in the culture of Silicon Valley where I live, a fashionable fascination with ideas of biofluidity, interchangeable parts and fluid identities, and an almost religious commitment to utopian ideas of technological transcendence. There are reports 
that technology company employees are microdosing with LSD, taking tiny amounts of LSD on a daily basis to promote more creative productivity. And at the marking of the creation of the Society for Regenerative Medicine, William Hazeltine, head of human genome sciences, stated, the real goal is to keep people alive forever. In light of this escalating momentum of advance and our shifting cultural assumptions and social attitudes, it seems clear that we need a clarification of the terms, concepts, and a priori assumptions within which our ideas of human nature and human flourishing are established and expressed. Yet as we explore our varied approaches, it's immediately apparent that to radically distinct and seemingly incommensurable terms of description frame our self-understanding, one from the detached and objective view of the empirical sciences, and the other from our subjective inward experience as sensitive, passionate, and purposeful living beings. The descriptive terms of the physical sciences, matter and energy expressed in the language of mathematics, followed to a large extent stand in the biological sciences and adapted by the social sciences, are in sharp contrast with the more human level approaches of phenomenology, aesthetic thought, and personalism, where concepts such as mind, beauty, and spirit are often used to refer not just to humans, but to, poor, to core perceived realities of the cosmos. As physicist Russell Stannard has noted, we draw on this more personal level when describing the very source and sustaining power of all reality. Our language about God as creator and ground of being is drawn from inward experience and expressed in personal terms such as love, purpose, compassion, goodness, and morality, expressions that do not figure in physics equations. He goes on to say that language used in reference to God is fundamentally that of consciousness, the aspect of human life that is at once most subjectively evident, yet most inexplicable within the current conceptual and methodological tools of empirical science. Which tradition or int intuition should we trust? Our current science or our long-standing religious ideas. A first good step would be to openly acknowledge that much of what is real remains beyond the reach of our current scientific tools and methodologies. That despite the remarkable, remarkable advances of the empirical approach, much of the science of the human person remains deeply mysterious. So on a practical level, what is needed is a comprehensive wisdom-seeking inquiry initiated with the goal of gaining a deeper understanding of human nature and human purpose amid the challenges and opportunities of advancing biotechnology. Through careful consideration of how we differ from other animals, animal species and current and foreseeable intelligent machines, we may seek a richer perspective on the biological, social, and spiritual implications of our particular embodied form and inward experience as human beings. Framing our consideration with reflections on the difference between humans, animals, and machines provides a helpful heuristic, conceptual bookends in the story of our nature animals as essentially corporeal beings and machines as abstract information processing devices provide useful conceptual poles for clarifying the distinguishing characteristics of our species. Moreover, as outlined below, many of the coming opportunities and challenges in biotechnology will involve ambiguous admixtures of humans and animals and humans and machines, and sooner than most people realize, the lines between the organic and inorganic 
will become increasingly difficult to draw. There is already a biohybrid robotic device that navigates with optogenetically controlled rat skeletal muscles. So, humans and machines. To begin our consideration of the bookends by comparing humans and machines seems at first to be harder. But at least at this point in our technological process, it's far easier. No one denies humans are animals or that animals resemble humans in important respects. The question has always been what kind of animal and how different from others are we? But what does it mean if we are machines? Or perhaps more disturbingly, if some machines are like us? And what does it mean to say our minds are a technology like other technologies in being a set of mechanisms for the routine solution of a class of problems? There's something not quite right here something smuggled in without our barely noticing it. The human mind is an embodied mind, mysteriously issuing forth from within a living organism. Inseparably, body and mind, a psychophysical unity. That is the way we experience ourselves, sometimes feeling like free-floating thought, but then acutely pulled back and aware of our physical frame. And though since it is a mystery, that intuition might be wrong. It does seem that the mind is materially mediated and therefore arises within the minuscule molecular motions that we casually call mechanisms. And therefore, in a certain sense, we are technology of sorts. But what sort? But even if the mind is materially mediated, it is more than a mechanism since it apprehends and draws into awareness concepts and ideas, immaterial realities, that are as real or more real than matter itself. And by the way, who knows what matter is anyway? That is, the mind is internally operated, not just externally ordered like, machine, like human created machines. There is a self there, qualities of consciousness, including subjectivity and sense of freedom that are very unlike any kind of mechanism we know of. Machines and logical reasoning may seem similar, both mathematical, mathematical in both their cause and effect relationships and other ways. But in the human mind, there are other kinds of thinking going on. It's not just mathematical reasoning. The human mind has, the thinking within the human mind is surrounded, suffused, and strategically deployed through the powers of, it, it strategically deploys the powers of computation that the mind is capable of, but it sits within the frame of hopes and fears, sifting, sorting, searching out solutions with meaning and personal significance, what has been called the enchanted loom. Early in the computer revolution, Stanford psychologist David Rummelhart famously said, the knowledge is in the connections. Though at the time, that was a brilliant insight regarding machine operations. Taken literally, it cannot be true. There is no knower in a computational device. Leibniz warned us. Moreover, it must be confessed that perception and that which depends upon it are inexplicable on mechanical grounds. That is to say, by means of figures and motions. He went on to imagine that if we my, if you could take the mind, or the, take the brain and expand it up in size while keeping its proportions and operations the same, so that we could then walk through it like we might walk through a mill, he said if we did this, 
we would see all these operations happening. In this case, it would be neurotransmitters pouring across synapses and so forth. But we still, he says, we still would not understand what is going on when we perceive, when we feel, uh, when we sense ourselves. The astrophysicist Arthur Eddington put it more plainly. Our knowledge of physics is only an empty shell, a form of symbols. It is knowledge of structural form and not knowledge of content. All through the physical world runs that unknown content, which must surely be the stuff of our consciousness. But what is that unknown con content that Eddington speaks of? 25 years ago, Terry Winograd, a uh, professor of computer science, again at Stanford, argued that the human mind is infinitely more complicated than mathematical logic would allow, that the patchwork rationalism that has guided AI research for the previous 30 years was a misuse of analogy and a wrong-minded approach. He stated plainly, Seekers after the glitter of intelligence are misguided in trying to cast it in the base metal of computing. Since it was glitter, I made it gold colored. <laughs> Winograd cautioned that computers may be better understood as language machines, machines that manipulate symbols, machine code, rather than thinking machines. But he noted, that human language, unlike machine code, ultimately depends on tacit understanding, not susceptible to mechanistically determinable mathematical logic. In other words, there's something very different from the way a machine and a human compute, even, under, even do what they do. Tacit understanding, tacit as implicit, implied, but not stated, with a content that's understood but not expressed, and may be inexpressible. For the human mind, that term tacit was described by Michael Polanyi as personal knowledge. As he explained, we cannot know more than we, we can know more than we can tell. He went on to say, this is Polanyi now, he went on to say, that not only is there knowledge that cannot be adequately articulated by verbal means, but also that all knowledge is rooted in such tacit knowledge. That's a very profound thought. It requires a lot of reflection. But he's saying that the person knows through his personal being things that cannot be reduced to co computer code or any other mathematical logic. If one steps back, to consider more deeply what is actually going on in the embodied human mind, it's clear it is dramatically unlike machine processing. The organismal self has a distinct human awareness of existential realities, of personal place and purpose within the world. And like every organism, a human person dwells as precarious being potent but perishable, and as with all sentient being, passionate and purposeful, churning and bubbling within the multiple streams of pleasures, pains, memories, aspirations, hopes, and fears. That's what's going on in the human mind. This human interpretive frame of tacit knowledge is of the personal autobiographical self, the narrative self our sense of who we are, the nature of the world, and our place in it. A vast and varied store of memories and personal intentions sets the content of every thought that humans have. And, and by the way, I, I was thinking about it the other day, that it's possible, given that kind of tacit knowledge and that context, the large context of, of memories and hopes and so forth that's behind every human thought, it's possible that no animal ever has the kinds of thoughts that we have, that we may be dramatically different than we, more than we even realize. 
these in turn, these, these memories, personal intentions that set the content of thought, these in turn are embedded within the interpretive framework of culture, within a mystic and mythic cosmology of origins and ultimate ends. Tacit understanding, personal knowledge, flowing forth from the inward experience of our journey within the world. Just like your faith frames all the context of every thought you have in some way. That's the tacit knowledge that can't explain, but it's there. Today, the impoverished patchwork rationalism that Terry Winograd spoke of er, in earlier AI has been superseded by deeper and more opaque processes of so-called machine learning, algorithms and statistical models that computer systems use to effectively perform a specific task without explicit instructions. But again, the machine is not like the human mind. It appears to employ an entirely different mode of operation. Intense pattern recognition is what primarily machine learning is. It's a kind of brute force processing in search of functional solutions, lacking the subtlety and comprehensive personal context and character of human cognition. And you all know that, that some months ago, a computer beat the world pro at Go. Remember this one? So it, it, it uh, defeated the guy at Go. Chess, the computer was able to just simply calculate 30 moves in advance and win. So chess was understandable. But computer experts thought, well, well, be very hard to get a computer to beat somebody at go because it involves lots of intuitive steps and you can't you can't do it by sheer crunching of computation it's there there's something going on elsewhere anyway what happened is the computer uh, took the took on churning out playing games 29 million games thousands of times the experience of the best player using two megawatts of energy to learn, that's the equivalent of what you can run a small city on. And even today, a single game, to play a single game, the computer uses about two kilowatts, which is 100 times the 20 kilowatts needed to run the human brain. So you can see something else, something's going on different even than the processing. There's an efficiency and there are shortcuts and there's context, it's all very mysterious, but it's different, it's there. So Go is interesting, um, it just can't do, it can do things, but it can't, we don't know how it does it, but it's still not human thinking. So machine learning is, at least for now, still a metaphor, and like all metaphors, it carries a certain analogy of similarity, but is not the thing to which it is compared. So the problem is not in the use of the metaphor, but in its overextension, what Richard Lewontin referred to as a process of backwards etymology. First, we use a term of familiarity as a tool for understanding. And then we reverse the order and use it to understand ourselves. Artificial intelligence, in some way, may be mind-like. But that does not make the human mind computer-like. Despite their claims to model or mimic the mind, computer scientists have done no more than create a richly suggestive and culturally resonant metaphor that can help us think about what it means to think. Those who dispense wild speculations about complete uploading of the human mind in silico would do well to reflect on the indispensable role of the organic substrate that supports the functioning of human consciousness with all the complexity of personal context and content that implies. These reflections on tacit knowledge and embodied knowing lead us out of the Silicon Valley to the marshlands and mountains on either side, directly back to living nature and the mystery of animal minds. And most problematically, the question of what is it that distinguishes the human species from all other living beings. Throughout history, there have been 
repeated attempts to identify a single distinguishing characteristic that defines human nature and endows a privileged status within the, more, the natural and moral orders. I want to read you a few of these because they're very funny. Um, so we were considered the political animal, the laughing animal, the tool-making animal. All these things are partly true. The cooking animal, the, f the uh, animal that forms opinions, um, the animal that possesses private property, um, the laughing animal, um, the only animal that can't wiggle its ears. <laughs> but whereas previous concepts of human uniqueness were built on direct ob observation, the featherless biped, the animal that blushes, and theoretical abstractions, an individual substance of a rational nature, new scientific tools for imaging, probing, and manipulating are allowing deeper penetration into the biomolecular mechanisms that underlie species similarities and distinctions. So now I have a new way to go into it. Yet, it's notable that throughout this long tradition, there was reference to both body and mind. We sense that the human difference and the difference it makes are most deeply distilled in the meaning of minds, yet the body is there as well. Even the idea of the rational being, as formulated first by Boethius, was not some kind of pure mental operation, not ratiocination, but a rich and fuller human experience, as with the Greek concept of logos. And, of, and the Christian concept of Logos, obviously. And of course, the animal that blushes is a direct reference to the human body, but also implicitly a reference to mind. But mind in its inwardness, self-conscious, sensitive, and socially aware, morally and spiritually alert to the boundaries of self-disclosure, shame, and our personal place within the larger arena of the human story. Mark Twain's quip that Humans are the only species that blushes and the only species that needs to is revealing here, relevant to our uniquely spiritual place within the natural order. Yet as our scientific understanding has deepened, it has become apparent that even where there are identifiable distinctions, moral emotions, abstract reasoning, and symbolic language, etc., they have deep roots in the origins of life. More and more, we've come to question our traditional notions of human uniqueness and come to see ourselves in continuity with our ancestral origins. Even the idea that we are the only species that has the capacity for self-recognition has been challenged by the mirror test. You know that test. I'm sure you've all seen these things. Now it's been passed by gorillas, chimps, elephants, dolphins, though only by certain members of those species. And more recently, there was an announcement it was passed by fish, but that's truly controversial. I don't believe it. But anyway, um, moreover, modern genomics has established an unexpectedly small number of human genes, around 20,000, an extensive homology similarity between our recent and even distant mammalian ancestral species. It seems clear that, as Francois Jacob noted 50 years ago, nature is a great tinkerer. And species differences are largely the result of changes not in the proteins coded by the genes, but in gene regulation, that which controls the production of the genes in quantity and chronology. It's a little like, the difference between species is a little like baking. You can make everything from croissants to cupcakes from the same basic ingredients, depending on how you mix them and treat them. It's been said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And this is certainly true of the evolution of animal forms. As with body form, common themes built on shared foundations set the fundamental infrastructure of animal minds emotions, social cognition and communication, and even hints in animals of cultural transmission, well, not very much. But again, it is easy to overinterpret homology and identity. And again, the misplaced metaphors can work in both directions, considering animals like persons with rights or viewing all human motivations and perturbations 
as, as serving basic biological needs, the man as beast, denying specialness to human beings. This is evident, obviously, in much of our culture. I mean, I love the Beatrix Potter's little pictures, but that's not actually the way a bunny is, or the little mouse. Um, our tendency right now is to see more in animal minds. I think that's a good thing. But it's also easy to devalue the human mind in the process of that. And so it, it's, it's a complicated matter. Um, certainly, we should be kind to animals and, and see what's, what's there. But uh, one of my friends works in a, in a neurobiology lab at Stanford and has a sign over his desk. After years of working with monkeys, he says, never overestimate the mind of a monkey. <laughs> and of course, Coco the gorilla uh, is supposed to have done language and all sorts of complicated things. And they even said that she had great affection, Robin Williams and all this. You saw that probably in the news. So I went up the hill because Coco uh, lived, just died, but Coco lived up about three miles above me in, in the mountains behind Stanford. And, I went and spent a whole afternoon with Coco. I knew Penny Patterson. And I got to tell you, it was very, very interesting. But it was very unconvincing to me that Coco was like a human being. Uh, Coco kept pointing my mouth. She wanted me to open my mouth so she could look at my gold fillings. That, but you didn't get the sense that there was a, what was going on there was, was what was going on in even an, a, a baby. Though we share many capacities with animals, including certain aspects of intelligence, it's important to recognize that a quantitative difference can be the basis of a qualitative difference. A, degree, a difference of degree can be a difference of kind. And the human brain is 3.5 times larger than expected for an ape of our size. Likewise, reorganization of anatomical, physiological, or neurological characteristics and novel combinations of functions can lead to radically new emergent properties. Though we share the basic brain parts with other mammals, their proportions and the functional dominance of their interconnections differ in important ways. This hierarchy of neural refinement converges in the prefrontal cortex the center of abstract analysis, planning, decision making, and rational comprehension of and control. And that is a brain region in human beings that is five, five times larger than it is in chimps. Difference in quantity can be a difference in quality. Moreover, even small mutations in gene regulation can have a dramatic impact on species form and function. This is evident in the anatomical and neurological changes in our vocal apparatus that allow spoken language. Most animal vocalizations seem to be under the control of emotion rather than cognitive cognition. They are automated information exchanges, fixed action patterns, limited in terms of flexibility and meaning. Typically, they just have to do with things like reproduction, food and alarm. Actually, as I was reading that, I was thinking that's pretty much what we talk about too. But, <laughs> <laughs> but even great apes do not seem to have the voluntary fine motor control of the facial muscles of voice that we use in speech. And their vocal apparatus does not enable articulation of the required vowels essential for speech. Small differences can make a huge difference in a species. Moreover, even when apes have been taught to use symbols to communicate, their range and depth of expression is very limited. As one re researcher who had worked for years commented, we can teach them to speak, using symbols that is, we can teach them to speak, but they have nothing to say. Human speech, on the other hand, is primarily driven by cortical areas in the left hemisphere that allow for voluntary control and extreme flexibility. With its unlimited range of sequential sounds, human language allows the communication of a vast range of ideas, setting the essential foundations for cooperative sociality, teaching, and the transmission and accumulation of culture. This distinctive example of anatomical and neurological revision 
allowing a greater range of response may be a key to the broader foundations of human freedom. And what I'm going to tell you now is not very well known, so this may be interesting to you and new to you. Among developmental geneticists, there is considerable current interest in the less is more mechanism as the most likely basis of certain unique human traits. By this hypothesis, through the relaxation of deterministic genetic mechanisms that fine-tune other species to a particular niche, human beings became a more general purpose organism. Liberated from fixed action patterns, we are open to a wider range of response. Together with the unique flexibility and adaptability evident in our anatomical form, and we, we can move our bodies in ways that no other animal can do. Just think of our shoulders and our hands. Together with our anatomical form and the high level of neuroplasticity, this liberation from fixed actions sets the condition for greater top-down, that means neurologic thinking control, of human behavior. Ideas, concepts, and moral and spiritual principles become the central axis of human motivation and action, giving ascendancy to intelligence, imagination, and free will. Indeed, the open and indeterminate character of human nature is close to the core of our species defining distinction. We are a general purpose organism, adapted for adaptability in every dimension of our nature, both somatic and psychic. With our capacities for comprehension and control, we have no set way of being in the world. We are, metaphorically speaking, a furless creature clothed by culture. Because we're fur furless, we can put on clothes and dwell in almost any environment. The French existentialist Simone de Beauvoir is reported to have said, human beings are that species which by nature has no nature. Well, that of course is not true. Our adaptability, our open indeterminacy is grounded in a highly refined biology the biology of our particular bodily form and mind and brain. The meaning of our lives depends on it. This is an especially important point. In the coming era of biomedical technology, we will need a deeper understanding of this fragile biological balance, lest in our quest for technological transcendence, we write ourselves out of our own story. And this brings us back to the mystery of the embodied mind. How does it emerge from the most minute molecules, proteins, polymers, cells, and circuits, and at the same time, stretch forth in contemplation of the furthest reaches of the cosmic order? What a mystery we are. The human brain, three and a half pounds, the most complex physical structure in the known universe. A hundred billion neurons in networks of such millisecond speed that they integrate, by some estimates, a quadrillion synaptic connections in a fantastic behind-the-scenes choreography that makes possible the thought and movement of real-time life at the level of human experience. But how do we go from chemicals to consciousness, from primary physical forces to the vibrant sensitivity and self-awareness of the human person. What a mystery. Even a brief survey of the natural forces and conditions that have shaped our nature may deliver important insights regarding human distinction and human dignity, insights that will be especially important as we prepare to use biotechnology to operate on our nature. When we look back at the biological process that has brought us into being, whether conceived as progressive evolution across time or successive layers of creation, I don't want to speak theologically here, scientifically, look at the layers of different qualities of natural expression as organisms. At every level, the unfolding of life's diverse forms and functions reveal new and previously unseen dimensions of nature and so revise our understanding of the nature of nature. The, neuro, the neurologist Antonio Damasio has said, the mind had to be first about the body 
or it could not have been. In other words, the mind arose in service to the body and continued existence of the being. To make sense of the emergence of mind within living nature, we must consider the challenges of basic survival and the primary processes of shaped and sustained life across its long and varied ascent. While early life forms adapted through mutation and reproduction, a kind of species level adaptation, the individual being dispensable to the process, more complex cellular systems soon emerged that allowed individual organisms to adjust to changing environmental conditions. This extension of the biological foundations of functional adaptation was accomplished to an increasing range of vital powers of perception and action. For example, an organism, very primitive organisms, can detect food and move toward it. It's astonishing to realize what these basic vital powers can accomplish in the absence of mind how complex, capable, and apparently purposeful a purely mechanical biological system can be. But mind you, I'm talking about a living biological mechanism. So I want to show you a video, if I can get it to work, um, of a mindless mechanism and what it can accomplish. So this is a neutrophil, a white blood cell in the bloodstream chasing after bacteria, okay? It's all based on chemotaxis. It depends on the direct chemical signal and a fixed mechanical response, albeit a biological mechanism. It lacks completely the adaptive, isn't it cool when he finally gets it and grabs it? <laughs> It, it lacks completely the adaptive flexibility of genuine choice, self-awareness, or will that characterizes a mind, yet it gets the job done. But what is clear is that even this white blood cell has a unifying principle, an inbuilt coherence that organizes and coordinates its integrated actions toward a purposeful end. It vividly demonstrates the remarkable properties and potentials of organic molecules. There is no computer or robot even remotely like this. So that's the first principle. Carbon biology is extremely flexible and, and capable of amazing things. With the, with the earliest emergence of brains evident in the fossil record, record uh, more than 500 million years ago, the limited capacities of perception and locomotion in simple organisms were transcended by specialized networks of integrated response. The first brains are attributed to jellyfish, but that's really not, they're just simple neural networks that coordinate locomotion. In more complex organisms, specialized differentiation of the head region with its organs of sensory perception and communication was paralleled, in, par paralleled internally by cerebral structures capable of processing more complex impressions of the surrounding environment. Systems of memory developed to record images from both the external and internal sensory input, allowing organisms a sense of their body boundaries and identity and continuity of self within the world. These capabilities allowed the extension of life into more varied and challenging environments, which led to the progressive refinement of integrated motor and endocrine systems that formed the biological basis of emotions. Emotions had their evolutionary origins as coordinated adaptive adjustments, such as the postural and visceral changes that place an organism in a condition of readiness of response. For example, fear increases heart rate and protective posture, both, both very adaptive for what fear is provoking the fear. These together with perception, that is emotions, together with perception, associative processing, and memory form the foundations for the most primitive minds. As the demands of sensory perception and action became increasingly complex, organism, that was supposed to be with the emotions, okay? As the demands of sensory perception and action became increasingly complex, organisms evolved with a sense of integrated inner sense of subjective feelings 
associated with these primary physiological foundations of emotion. Within a rising tide of sensation and self-awareness, sustained programs of response came to be motivated and coordinated by an inwardly felt sense of appetite, drive, or desire. I, I put this red picture of, I couldn't figure out how you show desire. So it's, it's red like Valentine's Day, okay. Um, <laughs> desire, potent but perishable animal life by its very character is precarious being. Desire, prefigured as need, forms the central axis of survival. Consider the power of hunger for food or the longing for sexual union in sustaining life, both driven by desire. Together with awareness and action, desire aligns and empowers the effort, effortful and purposeful processes of organic being. Desire distills as a coherent sense of self, urgently engaged in the essential tasks of life. Animal being is essentially passionate being. The unconscious processes of plant life are transcended by the inner awareness and purposeful desire that form the central axis of animal life. With further biological elaboration, more capable and conscious animal kinds are interwoven in deeper articulation with one another within the multifarious forms of an evolving ecological whole. The varied senses are extended and refined, allowing a fuller disclosure of the world, not just in breadth and precision, but in the causal connections be across time and space. Desire becomes the seed of comprehension and control. You know, it actually feels good when you solve uh, a, a mathematical equation, you know, like in geometry, remember that? Um, desire becomes the seed of comprehension and control. Together with awareness and action, it forms the very infrastructure of the mind. As Leon Cass has rightly pointed out, desire, not DNA, is the deepest principle of life. With the encompassing consciousness and self-awareness of human life, desire distills as a sense of integrated identity, sustaining personal purpose and beckoning beyond to the highest reaches of human life in its aesthetic, moral, and spiritual extensions. But this raises a matter of bitter dispute in our current controversies over the meaning of mind. Is mind just another mechanism of primary evolutionary goals, calculation and computation in the service of mere survival and reproduction? Are we simply robot vehicles of selfish genes? Or do our thoughts, intentions, and aspirations reflect genuine dimensions of freedom, purpose, and personal significance within the cosmos? Charles Darwin, in his research on orchids, was led to conclude that, this is a quote, the final end of the flower is the production of seed. It's very much like what Dawkins says, right? The final end of the flower is in the production of seed. John Ruskin, the foremost art critic of the Victorian era, objected. The flower exists for its own sake, not for the fruit's sake. And though these controversies eventually undercut Ruskin's religious convictions, he was right, at least at the level of animal life. Regarding means and ends, the philosopher Hans Jonas explains, and this is a little dense, but follow it because this is a very profound comment he makes. Regarding means and ends, the philosopher Hans Jonas explains, not duration or survival as such, but duration of what is the question. This is to say that such means of survival as perception and emotion are never to be judged as merely means but also as qualities of the life to be preserved, and therefore as aspects of the end, the purpose. It is one of the paradoxes of life that it employs means 
which modify the end and themselves become part of it. The feeling animal strives to per preserve itself, not just preserve itself, but preserve itself as a feeling, not just a metabolizing entity. That is, it strives to continue the very activity of feeling. When applied to human life, this is a key insight. It affirms that even as we are a part of purposes beyond ourselves, we are persons. And the processes of our individual lives have a meaning, a significance that is inseparable from the cosmic whole and its mysterious destiny. These phylogenetic refinements of living nature, the vital powers of awareness, action, and desire, culminate in the human form, the foundations of our, our embodied minds. The human form, with its capacity of resonant rationality and relationality, intelligence within an intelligible order of being. In the words of John Templeton, we are a knowing creature created by a God who would be known. We are the rational animal through and through in the expanded sense of rational, not just ratiocination or mathematical calculation. We are the rational animal through and through, not just in our computational capacities and abstract conceptual thought, but in our very bodily configuration and way of being in the world, our awareness, our actions, and our aspirations. The human transformation to upright form is reflected in nearly every detail of our deep structure, both somatic and psychic. For example, the freeing of the upper limbs. I bet you never thought of your body this way, but just think about it for a minute. Look at how our upright posture allows the freeing of the upper limbs and the refinement of the hand, what Aristotle called the tool of tools. Um, this in turn promoted a greater sense of, was promoted by a greater sense of fine motor control and the cerebral capabilities that could coordinate and sustain more com complex actions on the world. So there's a unity between body form, comprehension, creativity, and constructive action on the world. We're a very unique creature in our capacity to manipulate the world with our hands. Likewise, the unique range and refinement of our varied senses, touch, hearing, sight, each complementing and cross-referencing each other. In our ancestral origins, as sight replaced smell as the most prominent sense, it allowed rapid perception of objects and actions at great distance. The upright posture, sight, seeing above, looking outward, sight allows insight. Furthermore, reason is not literal, but metaphorical. The very structures of our categories and concepts come from the nature of our bodily experience, the world as we know it, by living in it. I bet you really never stop to think about how your body experiences sets the frame of your mind and the metaphors you use both to think and to speak. Time, for example, is understood by its representation through the experience of movement through space. These primary bodily-based concepts then serve as metaphors for abstract concepts, such as the force of a reasoned argument or the attraction of love. There is no human mind separate from and independent of the body and no pure reason apart from bodily experience. Moreover, our similar experience as embodied beings, that is the way we share the experience of the world in commonality, that sh similar experiences provides the terms, experience provides the terms for our thought and language that make possible genuine communion with one another, communication and cooperative culture. The very configuration of our upright bodily form places us in a face-to-face -face encounter with one another. And the furless face with its more than 30 muscles of expression and vocal control make possible a deep and genuine communication. 
Moreover, the very way we enter the world, dependent on others, assures that we are attuned and entrained to the community of which we are a part. Within the distilled conceptual frame of a shared language, a deepened consciousness emerges together with the collective coordination of minds and the momentum of cultural advance. I love this little picture. Human beings, by the way, as Aristotle noted, are of a unique capacity for imitation, which is crucial for the transmission of culture. And look at this tender little picture. Together, we move beyond, within this network of communication, shared experience, together we move beyond the imperatives of the present to the creative constructions of cultural meanings and values. We weave an interpretive story rich with ideals and aspirations, a narrative by which we navigate the world. This increasing freedom and breadth of awareness is in turn extended by the extraordinary adaptive benefit of the creative imagination. Here the primary principle first expressed as mutation in matter is extended and transcended by permutations of mind, the self-generated mental production of possibilities independent of the constraints of immediate physical reality. Grounded in the raw materials of memory, the symbolic mind is capable of, capable of detaching image from object, recombining images in new ways, envisioning scenarios and sequences apart from time and space, and anticipating their implications and outcomes. This is yet another powerful form of freedom in which we can imagine possibilities and try them out in a kind of mental dress rehearsal without the expense of time and risk of resources in the process. The human capacity for imagination goes way beyond just adaptive anticipation. Imagination is not merely replayed memory or imitation, but envisioned creation, forming mental images, maintaining them in the mind, and achieving their realization signifies intention, planning, and implementation of ideals. This imagining and realizing of ideals is the fullest manifestation of natural human freedom. Whereas most creatures exist in an unbroken immediacy of life, reacting to immediate perceptions and then reacting just unbroken immediacy, humans have the capacity to draw both from the past and the future bring them into the present. From stored, lear from learning stored as memory, we, tr we draw from the past and, and we anticipate through creative imagination. So we, have, we don't live in immediacy, we live in an amazing expanded arena of thought. The, the immediacy of animal existence becomes the mediated flexibility and freedom of human consciousness together with the ceaseless drive to organize the unexplained, the cognitive imperative, the capacity to calculate, extrapolate, and recombine are used to reconfigure that which is into that which could be. While most creatures are pushed by biological and ecological exigencies, just the imperatives of being and surviving, we are pulled into the future by our desires, dreams, and images of fullest flourishing. From the human capacity for imagination and the drive to pursue the possible comes something unprecedented in the history of nature, the freedom of aspiration toward an envisioned ideal. The human ascent to a coherent moral and spiritual ideal is the fullest extension, the culmination, of the most profound developmental thrust in living nature. Within human community, we explore our world in the counterpoint and corrective of a shared dialogue, seeking a comprehensive understanding of existence 
that stretches forth for the fullness and flourishing of life. And we sense a significance to human life that mysteriously transcends the biological process that has brought us forth. Within the struggle and strife of earthly life, we become acutely aware of the central significance of both suffering and self-sacrifice. Conscious and comprehended, conscious and comprehending, we are lifted to the level of love, beholding with wonder our place and possibility within the whole. We are a revolution within nature that revises our understanding of the very nature of nature. We are matter come to mind and moral awareness amid increasing intuitions of a transcendent design and destiny overarching all of life. We ascend to an awareness of the spiritual unity of an ordered cosmos where the material and the moral flow forth from a single creative source consummated and completed through the emergence of the human person. From the dust of Eden has come an eternal destiny in the very life of love. Thank you.